Let's have a look at the first one. Now, uh, it looks weird, I'll grant you that. And many things in mathematics look weird, but if you take the time to sort of stare at them a little bit harder, you think, wait a second, I know how to do this. You can see, in fact, the terms in the first line have been given to you exactly nicely paired up. There's four terms, pair them up. So you can see what I've done is I've got those first two with a common factor of K, these two with a common factor of minus M, and then the rest of it kind of writes itself once you identify those, okay? So I've paired them, I've then got the factorization, two binomials, and you can read off your solutions, okay? Moving further down, I, I think this is as far as you can simplify it. Um, I took out, out of the square root of 48, I took out the square root of 16. Can I just emphasize to you, I was just recently teaching year 10 how to do this kind of thing, and you did this last year. Um, what a difference it makes just for your own mind if you say to yourself, I'm not taking out 16, I'm taking out the square root of 16. You wouldn't believe the number of year 11 students, year 12 students, who in a panic, in a rush, what they will write is plus or minus 16 root 3 because they're thinking of the 16 and they forget, wait, what am I doing with that as I take it out? So it becomes a 4. So please notice that. It's a very common error. Don't do it. All right. Now, when you come down to here, uh, sorry about that. Didn't really give you enough space. Maybe you looked at this and thought, wait, what, what is this? Okay, let me show you what I've done. Yeah. On the left-hand side, you have a quadratic expression. Year 11. Year 11. On the left hand side you have a quadratic expression, it's being expanded. On the right hand side you've got a quadratic. Once you expand that, you can see that if this really is equal to this, the x squared terms, well, they sort of balance out. You've got x terms, they also have to balance out. So this is actually the way that I write it on the right hand side. This is the phrasing that I would use and I think that actually saying that is actually very important because it shows me you know. Why is Q equal to 3? Well, because if you have a look at the x terms, Q has to be 3. What else could it be in order to have minus 6x over here and minus 6x over there? They better be, right? They're equal. So I compare the x terms. Once you know what Q is, then on the right-hand side, you've got a Q squared. That's the constant term because there's no P's or Q's or X's or whatever. So Q squared must be 9, and that corresponds to P on the left-hand side. So that's where I get that from. Okay, now moving on to number 4. Can I just get a quick uh, thumbs up on that looks good or that doesn't look good? Yeah, thumbs up? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, I'm always, I'm always a bit doubtful when I look at funny numbers like that. Now, can I just point out? I want you to put on the Marcus hat for a second. Well, I mean, you should be putting on the Marcus hat right now. Okay. This is a rhetorical question. Just think about it. What do you think is the most common error that students make as they go through this working? What do you think, Russell? They just cancel out. The yeah. 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 So this, this is what I often see. See that? A lot of students. I wonder if any of you have written that. Because you see, oh yeah, gross, fractions. I know what to do, multiply through by 10. What you're thinking of is a very similar question. You're thinking of that, right? If you've got this expression equals zero, then you can multiply both sides by 10 and the right-hand side stays zero. The problem is, there is no right-hand side here. It's not an equation, it's an expression. That's why you can't solve it. You can only simplify it. So what I have done instead, is if I'm going to multiply all of this stuff by 10 to get rid of the fraction, then to keep things balanced, I have to divide by 10, otherwise what you've got is 10 times bigger than what you started with. So divide by 10, multiply by 10, and then you can collect your like terms. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, so um, either of these is fine. In this context, neither of them is really simpler than the other. Sorry, I hope you can see that. Um, I have a slight preference for the first one because factorization is usually a cool thing and um, I, don't, I don't gain anything by expanding. Um, if for instance this number were 20 instead of 21, oh, I'm going to get 2x at the end. That's kind of nice, but here it's like, yeah, it's just gross anyway, so that's that. Okay. 
question. Right. When it's simplified, can you just factorize it? Or simplified, uh, did you just need like factorize it? Which, uh, well, see, that's the thing. And we'll get more onto this later. It makes more sense when I introduce calculus. When we say simplify, sometimes factorized is best. And sometimes factorized is worst. You need to get it out of factorized form as quick as you can. At the moment, there's, there's no context or clues to tell you one or the other. That's why it's sort of going to wait until a later topic when I explain. At the moment, it doesn't matter. If they tell you expand or they tell you factorize, then it's clear. But if they say simplify, whatever. Right, uh, here we go. This is me changing the subject. So uh, can you make that out at the bottom? You can see, you can see you have to multiply across because in order to change the subject to any pronumeral, you've got to get all of those pronumerals together. So you can see, P on the numerator and P on the denominator, uh, they're on the same side, but I can't get them to work together. So that's why I multiply across, then I subtracted P, and I can factorize P out, and that gets him on his own. Okay? So this is pretty basic arithmetic uh, algebraic manipulation. This is all two years. Okay? So if it looked weird to you, you're like, I didn't know what direction to go in, pay close attention. This is bread and butter stuff. Okay? In the HSC, we call this question 11 material. Questions 1 to 10, it's the multiple choice. There are some weird, unusual questions in 1 to 10. But question 11, we're like, okay, here are the free, easy marks you should be able to do when you're half awake. These are the questions you'll get, so make sure you can sort of nail them. Band 6, it's won or lost <coughs> on question 11. Okay, so don't lose the easy marks. Can I move to the next column? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Okay, they give you this. If you've got this pair of equations, then find x and y, solve simultaneously, when m equals zero. So this is the way I approached it. I named my equations, as you can see. Uh, probably not necessary, but it's helpful. I'm just trying to communicate clearly. I've named them, and then I've said, well, let's work one at a time. Why was equation two the obvious choice? Uh, well, it has the M that they tell you about, but there's a more significant reason. The M could have been over here, and I still would have gone for that equation. Wait, so what was the, uh, eight is a uh, the, the question is, why did I start with, I, I called this one and I called this two. Why did I start with this one and not with this one? That's a real question. But I think the answer shouldn't take you too long. Because when M equals zero, you can just find X. Yeah, yeah. What you're, the way to articulate what you're sort of all seeing is that this equation over here, number two, it's an equation in one variable, once you take m out of the picture, okay? You've only got x's there, this, this, the rest of it is just numbers, so you just rearrange and you get a solution out. Whereas over here, you're stuck. You've got two variables, one equation. No matter how you twist and turn that, you're still gonna have two variables. So you can't solve it until you've got more information. So that's why I start with two, then I move on to one, and those are my values. 